congratulations. Any questions? What did you think? Did you watch it or did you have good questions? Yes. Where was everybody? <laughs> Where was everybody? Yeah. Last week it was online because I was in Utah doing a women's conference down there. Okay. And so it was only online last week. Uh, but the homework was there and the assignment was there. And so anybody have any, I don't know if you watched it or not, uh, but if you have any questions about or insights into your uh, method of communication in your home, uh, any, any feedback, any experiences that you had this week that you want, or concerning any other topic that you might want to discuss besides what we're going to talk about today, which is discipline. Any other? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anything? How is your communication in your home? Do you feel like you're connecting? Yes? Well, I feel like when they're talking to me about something like personal to them, I have an easier time. But when they're talking to me about their interests that I'm not interested in, I have a really hard time focusing on what they're saying. Yeah. Yeah. So they go on and on about these things that I just don't care about. And I have to be like, can I put your phone? You need to listen. <laughs> it's hard. Yes, and so at this stage of the game, it's more intentional. I mean, you're thinking about it, about what you should be doing, and what you, and are you getting better? Do you feel like? <laughs> they usually start a conversation when I'm in the middle of something on my phone, so then I have to be very focused of, put it down, it can wait. <laughs> okay, let's talk about that for a minute. If you're in the middle of something and they interrupt, like they're coming to you to interrupt, it is good for you to help them to learn respect for you. And so it would be good for you to say, you need to wait just a minute. I am busy for the moment, but give me two minutes or give me three minutes so that they learn that they don't have the right to just always be answered immediately. You know, they need to learn respect for you, therefore other people, and that teaches them you don't interrupt conversations. You don't interrupt, you know, if somebody's on the phone, you don't just come in and interrupt because you have something on your mind. And so that helps them. It's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing to say, okay, wait just a minute. But don't make that time period too long. You know, it, it needs to be relatively short that you end what you're doing and then focus on them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Anyone else? Yes, yes, yes. Um, sometimes you're talking to your child. I guess it's talking to mm -hmm. your child. And you see they're not gauging what you're saying or feeling what you're saying and figuring out how and when to come back to it that they will hear and feel the importance of the message that you're trying to share with them. And they're not just trying to blow you off. Yeah. You know, and um, and sometimes I find that frightening, like the inhumility of that. And, and you're really, you're digging deep and you're just trying to reach them to make sure that they actually know the importance and being able to communicate with the spirit that they, um, that they learn in the way they learn. So what have you found? What do you try to do? How do you try to fix that? Sometimes I have to step away. And then sometimes I have to collect myself and I have to go in prayer and just try to figure out, please help me to know how to say it the way they will want to hear it. Because sometimes I, I find my kids have it hard to be wrong. Feel It feels like they don't want to be wrong, and so there's an instant wall that goes up, and it scares me because if they can't learn or hear why it's important, I'm scared they're not going to make it in life, and it, it, it scares me, the inhumility of that. Absolutely. That's every parent's fear, but we can't parent out of fear. Yeah. So 
you have to realize that some of the things that you're trying to teach your children are intense to you right now. They're part of your deep-rooted testimony. And so they're, they're very uh, important and uh, sacred to you. And as you're trying to share with them, you want them to get it. You just want them to get it. You want them to get it. But sometimes, if you look back, when you were their age, your testimony wasn't what it is now. And so now you're trying to make this sweet little child receive on the level of your testimony now. Well, when you were that age, you certainly didn't have that testimony. So part of it is creating attachment in the ways that we've already discussed in uh, self-esteem and in learning their personalities with the color code, learning how to communicate well. So you're creating the attachment as the attachment grows, they will listen more to your heart. So you have to have that foundation first before you can begin to uh, share with them those deep testimonies that you have. And because they're so sacred to you, it becomes frightening and fearful when they don't receive it on the same level. But they're 10. They're, you know, 12. They're, they haven't had life's experiences that you've had yet and, and the testimony building experiences. And you're there to help them have those so that they can receive the foundation where they can receive those things on a very deep level. With that being said, we need to continually use many moments <clears throat> to bear testimony to them all along the way. But it's usually not the big oh, let me share with you, you know. And when they have misbehaved or they've done something wrong, that's not when they're ready to internalize deep doctrine. They are on the defensive. And so these other things help them to learn resilience. And resilience is that ability to do something wrong and bounce back and not get defensive and learn that doing something wrong is okay and how to do it different. And so much of that is going to be dependent on what we're going to talk about today is how you discipline. And so teaching them that it's okay to make mistakes, that we move forward, that's critical. But it has a lot to do with communication and discipline. So how you communicate discipline will set the foundation for a lot of whether or not you stay attached or whether they're going to disengage. Does that make sense? Okay. Anyone else? How's your um, marital communication? Is that good? Wonderful? The best? Yes? We're always having something come up where something's happening and the kids say, but I told Dad about it. We just don't, don't communicate with each other. I mean, get along great, but we don't communicate well. Yeah, and that can be an interesting experience. So what do you do? How do you handle haven't it? Got a, haven't got an answer yet. Still working that one out, huh? Yes. <laughs> awesome. Well, at least you're still working on it. That's good. That's good. Anyone else? We could, we could do a whole two hours on that one. That would be our communications from last week. And we'll do one on marriage. When we talk about marriage, we'll talk about how to communicate in, in a marriage. So, and it's a little bit different than parent-child to married partners. <coughs> Anyone else want to share a little bit? What did you think about the new thing about missionaries calling home? <laughs> Anybody besides Andrea have a missionary out? Sorry, because I, I don't know if they'll make the kids that are really homesick, more homesick kids, and the, the need. But then I, I, I feel like we love our kids so much, and we have experiences, and we want to help them succeed, and that we are an extra resource for them to see them through those things that are hard and help them to succeed. 
I am so excited. I love it. And I, it might be extra long though. <laughs> my, 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 um, my sister-in-law was just talking to her daughter and she's like, we were on the phone for three hours. So I was like, wow. And I was like, I, I, it's, it's exciting. Well, hopefully after the newness wears off, <laughs> we can be more appropriate yes. with it. Yeah. Because uh, I think the whole purpose this is Tanner one and one because I haven't really talked to anybody, but they're wanting us to get more involved in their missionary experience, which would ignite a fire in us to be more involved in missionary experiences here so that we can share missionary experiences, as well as to be a stability for those who suffer from depression and anxiety that when they find that they can talk at home and, and get that support, that it may be a real source of strength for them. So, but I, I, I think it's not to keep them apprised of all of the activities that are going on at home, because that creates homesickness, but more to share missionary experiences and uh, find joy in them. And, but it's, it's gonna take a while to get into and mission presidents, I'm sure, are sending out guidelines to their uh, missionaries, their elders and sisters in their mission, and how to appropriately use this new uh, opportunity. So I think there's going to be there's going to be a a flow in it uh, where both moms at home and missionaries learn how to use it appropriately and make it a real tool that will strengthen. Um, my grandson, who's on a mission, it was sort of like, okay, I'm too busy to call. You know, I got too much to do. I got, I got stuff to do. <laughs> so he sent his email, but it was, there was no call. There was no call. And I think it's interesting that those calls need to be initiated by the missionary. You know, that was one of the guidelines. So I think that that will also be an interesting uh, thing because sometimes moms at home want to call. So it has to be initiated by the missionary. And boy, Cody wasn't about to initiate it. He's got miles to go, miles to go. So it was fun, it was fun to get his email. Anyone else on communication or otherwise that before we start today? Okay, <coughs> then we'll just get going. If you did not, um, you know, if you kind of got lost last week with that change that we had, please go back and review that um, video on it because good communication is kind of the heart of how so many other things happen. If they can be internalized by our children. So it is really important. It is a foundation for all relationships, including your relationship with Heavenly Father. So they, they kind of have different experiences. I mean, as you view them, they're different, but the principles are the same. So as you um, think about that, and if you have a minute, review the notes in the syllabus, but kind of take a minute to uh, look over some of the things that were in that video, because I think that it will be helpful to you. It was a real important one, and I'm sorry that I wasn't here to teach it. But I have faith in you. You can do it. <laughs> okay, what we're going to talk about today is the one I promised you would be frustrating. So let's just start with the, the upfront. Uh, I expect you to go home frustrated. Even if you've had the class before, I kind of expect you to still be frustrated. Because today we're going to lay out all the problems, all the struggles all of the, um, the disconnects we have, as we with righteous intention want to help them be better because we know that'll make them happy. And them who say, I'm right. And, and they do not like to be faced with being called out at being wrong. And most children are not, they don't come to earth with this great deal of humility about yes, tell me when I'm wrong so I can be better. Though that's what we expect from them. 
We think that if we discipline correctly, that they will suddenly become remorseful and sad and say, oh, I am so sorry, I will do it differently next time, I am so sorry, thank you for your wisdom. And they don't do that. Mine never have. And so if yours do, I will be, I, I wanna hear about it. I really wanna hear about it. Because I just don't think that's the nature of being mortal. But I do think we all have to be corrected, either by Heavenly Father, which we need to be corrected regularly, or by our parents, or by a teacher, and we need to learn how to receive correction, knowing that correction is really for our good. How can we be better, or become better, or become, you know, if nobody tells us what we do wrong? If you were learning to play the piano and you didn't have a piano teacher who ever told you what was wrong, how would you learn to be a good piano player? You would just go on making the same mistakes over and over and over and not learn how to progress and make it better. So what we need to do is figure out then in this picture where we are and where we need to be and then what's the first step in getting where we need to be. So today what we're going to do is talk about kind of some of the challenges and problems and uh, that the children have, that youth have, and then how we, in trying to help them do it better and be better, have a disconnect. So, and then we're going to leave it. <clears throat> so I'm going to leave you frustratingly disconnected at the end of this class. But next week, when we come back, I will give you 14 tools, 14 tools of discipline. Now, with that being said, you can look forward to the next class, but truly, if you have done the first five lessons with real intent, being really focused on it, your need for discipline will greatly decrease. So, discipline Parenting is about building up children so they don't have to be disciplined. So they will have the courage to make right choices and you having taught them what those right choices are and then because of your attachment to each other, they have the courage and the desire to make those right choices. So I, I really can't emphasize the importance of the first five classes enough as a preventative for what we look at is discipline. Now with that, even if you were perfect, your children will misbehave because they're learning and they're growing and they live in a mortal world. And so no matter how much you do it perfectly, you, don't have, you won't have perfect children. We're not perfect and they're not perfect and they won't be. So then the key is to understand why they misbehave and what then is our part in correcting that misbehavior. So, you know, uh, one of the, um, one of my favorite quotes is by Boyd K. Packer, and I think it's in your syllabus, and it was actually given in 1970. But as, you, as we talk about discipline, this is the one I want you to remember is this quote, and he said, leave off trying to alter your child just for a little while and concentrate on yourself. When we discipline, isn't it with the purpose of altering their behavior? I mean, that's what we want to do. So this week, your homework is to leave off trying to alter them for this week and look at yourself. I can't help you change and do something different until you know where you are. You have to know where you are. Without, I want you to erase the feeling of, but if they would, if they would just obey, if they would just mind me, if they would just stop arguing, if they would just, and so then we want the discipline that makes them change. So instead of focusing on changing them for this week, I want you to look at yourself. And it's, it's important that in this assignment, your homework assignment, I want you to very honestly, and some of you, without getting into depression, without feeling guilt, 
I want you to honestly look at what you do when your children misbehave. How do you handle misbehavior? Do you yell? Do you lecture? Do you tell them what you want and then withdraw your affection? And some of you will say, I don't, well, I don't do that. But you kind of quit talking to them or quit smiling at them. And it may be body language, it may be physical, that you withdraw. But sometimes we as parents tend to throw two-year-old temper tantrums when we don't get our way. And yet we don't acknowledge that that's what we're doing. So I want you to look, really look sincerely. So when one of your children is misbehaving, rather than focusing on why are they doing that and what are they doing and why are they arguing and who's right or who's wrong, I want you to notice what you do to take care of the situation. And it will be hard for you to be really honest in that because you'll feel justified in doing what you do because of the child misbehaving. So no justification and no guilt. I just want you to know what you do. So this uh, Elder Packer's quote goes on and he says, the changes must begin with you, not your children. You cannot continue to do what you have been doing even though you thought it was right and expect to unproduce some behavior in your child when your conduct was one of the things that produced it. Teaching discipline to children then requires that parents discipline themselves. Which is a very interesting quote. So this week is for you to watch you. Next week, it'll be for you to watch your children. But this week, it's for you to watch you. And I love what he said when he said, you uh, can't continue to do what you've been doing, even though you thought it was right, and expect to unproduce some behavior in your child when your conduct was one of the things that produced it. So we don't, we don't look at that thinking that we're causing misbehavior, but sometimes how we handle correction actually tends to cause misbehavior, which is an interesting thought. So in the, in the beginning, when Adam and Eve were put in the Garden of Eden, Heavenly Father gives the perfect example of discipline. And so he, he put them in the Garden of Eden, and then he instructed them. He taught them the things that they needed to do. So this is where it comes, the first, I think the first lesson we had about uh, Take Time to Teach, where we talk about teaching to their internalization. It's teaching past knowledge, it's teaching to understanding, so that they can get down to the point where they're acting on it. So that's the first thing that Heavenly Father did was he taught Adam and Eve in all of the things that they needed to know in the gospel. He also, as he was teaching up front, gave them rules and consequences. Now, we like to throw those in in the moment of the misbehavior, throw in the consequence where they didn't know what, what it was before. Now we're throwing it in. But you notice Heavenly Father he threw in the rules and the consequences up front. He said, don't partake of that tree, and if you do, you will be cast out. But it's your choice. So he, he couldn't take away agency. He gave them agency. And then he left them alone. This is where sometimes we want to micromanage and helicopter parent. We don't leave them alone to make choices. We, we don't allow them sometimes to make mistakes. We ride them, ride them, ride them, ride them, so they won't not get all their homework in, or they won't, they won't make those mistakes, and therefore they don't learn from, you know, the, the consequences that follow can't teach them. It's our belaboring and lecturing that we think we're teaching them, and actually what we're doing is nagging. So Heavenly Father then left them alone, they were tempted, then they broke, they broke the rules, 
Then Heavenly Father enforced the, con the consequence without further lecture. He didn't come down and say, I told you not to do that. I told you if you did it, then you would be cast out. He just came down and cast them out. But before he did, again, there was an affirmation of his love for them and that he would be with them. And then he did. He cast them out. And so then, after he had administered the consequence with firmness and kindness and in great love, then, after they were cast out, he didn't leave them alone. He didn't withdraw from them. He was no longer in their physical presence, but the Spirit was with them. He sent angels to teach them. So they were continually supported and uplifted. So that becomes the role model for us in correcting misbehavior with our children. That we need to teach them up front, help them know consequences, follow through in love and kindness, being firm but kind, and then after, when they're experiencing the consequences, we don't rescue them and take them out of the consequences, but we stand beside them and support them and lift them while they're in the consequences. So that's the perfect role model. And so we just need to work, have a vision of that, and then work to try to make that happen. What happens frequently in our families is, if you look at that page in your syllabus that has the two triangles, I think they're facing each other. This is kind of typical of how many parents um, view agency. And what we do is when they're very young, we give them a great deal of free agency. And that's the triangle with the broad base, and then it goes to narrow. And so when they're teeny, you know, we just think they're so cute. They're so cute. They're just so fun. We, we excuse all of their behavior by saying, oh, but they're just so little. They just don't know better. They're just so fun. So when they come dancing out, when the ministering brothers are there and not dressed, we just say, oh, they're so cute. You know, they're so cute. And we tell them to go get dressed. But, you know, it's, it's just so fun. If they want to stay up and come into our bed at night and cuddle up with us and be awake and chat, with, it, they're just so cute. They're so fun. And if they, you know, we, if they have horrible manners at the table, it's just so cute. Now, as they get older, those very cute things are not cute anymore. What an 18-month-old does that's really cute, and a four-year-old does them, they're not cute. And so we think, boy, they just need to be, they just need to be taught. They need to be taught some manners. They need to be taught. Now, granted, there is uh, their ability to learn at different ages. The, the ability of an 18-month-old to sit still is very, very marginal. They just can't. But we need to start training in the beginning. Training to say prayers, training to sit during family home evening, which with an 18-month-old needs to be extremely short period of time. But teaching them that during that time, because now you're also teaching them to sit at sacrament meeting, and you're teaching them to, to begin that learning process to respect sacred things. And so what happens is when we parent this way, and give them a great deal of freedom. Then when they're four, five, six, we try to pull in that, pull in the reins. They will, uh, they, they will not be happy, and they will fight against us. So a little tiny person, you know, you give them your phone all the time because it keeps them quiet, and you can check out at the cash register, and you can do all these things, and, and they're just quiet, and it buys you peace. Then all of a sudden at four, you say, hey, I don't want my family always on screen, screen time. So I'm not going to let you have that all the time. At that point, when you take away that screen, you will get a lot of pushback, a lot of pushback because they've been allowed to have it all the time. So instead of doing it that way, the other triangle kind of is more the way the Lord gives us agency. He gives us a little bit, and then when we've 
show them that we can be responsible with that. You get a little bit more, and then you get a little bit more, and you get a little bit more, and then you get a little bit more. And so uh, privileges and uh, opportunities are earned, if you will, as a child grows older rather than getting everything when they're young and then trying to pull back and then having them earn them, you will always get pushback. You will always, always get pushback. So if, um, if you are already in that and you're trying to pull back now and take away some of those things and try to reteach, expect pushback. That doesn't mean it's wrong. It doesn't mean, it just means that you're gonna have a little bit more to overcome, but now's still the time to do it while they're young. But there will be more of a pushback if they've enjoyed that agency and now, you know, they're, you're trying to require a higher standard of them, they will, they will push back on you. So just remember that that's part of their growing up and what they see. Uh, Neil Maxwell, well, the scriptures, the Doctrine and Covenants, section 121, verse 43, it says, even patience is balanced by reproving betimes with sharpness when moved upon by the Holy Ghost. It's very important to understand two words in that scripture. One is betimes, and the other one is sharpness. And in a, this talk that's listed there by Neil Maxwell, he talks about the meaning of those two words. Be times he defines as being early on early on it's not you know when you just read it you think be times means occasionally but it doesn't it means early on so that means both early on in the child's life so as we start helping them learn self-discipline when they're very young then that's that's the best time to teach them, early on in their life. But it also means in any given situation to discipline early on in the experience. So don't just sit and argue, 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 argue about it and then impose a consequence or something, you know, a punishment. It means to resolve, to get out of conflict early on in the problem. And the sooner that you can come to resolution and agreement, of course, the better off it is. Now what does sharpness mean? Sharpness means with exactness, with clarity. And it also means one thing at a time. When we uh, deal with a, a difficulty, and we're talking about a problem with a child, and we need to be clear, very clear about what we understand they're saying and what our expectation is, which means about 90% of our lecturing shouldn't be there. Very clear, very simple, very exact, and we need to deal with one problem at a time. So, so often, if you have a teenager and they come home late, we'll start talking about, to them about being late and they have a curfew and they should know that they have a curfew. And last week, you were late, and the week before that, you were late. Those things should not enter this conversation. This conversation should be about this behavior. And that's all. And so when we start pulling up the past and bringing up all of the other sins they've committed, it makes them feel like they can never repent or get over something. And we unconsciously teach them that that's how Heavenly Father feels about them. Uh, Robert DeHale said, children look to their parents to see how Heavenly Father feels about them. And so we need to help with, when we're talking about be times and with sharpness, we're dealing about one thing and we're dealing in clarity and it's a very, very, uh, succinct what we want from them and, and what we're not happy about and they have the right to uh, discuss and tell their side with clarity. But those, are, those come into tools. 
I'm just giving this to you now so you look for this week and see if you do it with exactness, be times, sharpness, clarity, and one thing at a time. See if you do that. See if that's one of those applications that you already have mastered in your discipline. Okay? Now, children um, misbehave for a lot of different reasons. And usually it's because they're discouraged. We're going to talk exactly about those reasons here in a minute. But I want you to think about the fact that you are dealing with a child that's discouraged. And if they're discouraged, usually speaking, I mean, always speaking, that I, you need to build them up to have courage to do what you want them to do. Somehow we have in our mind that if we uh, make children feel worse about what they did, that they will behave better. For example, we have a child who has been biting little person and so we say go to your room you know you just need to get away from the other children so go to your room just go to your room and so the child runs to their bedrooms they're probably about three ish and so they run to their bedroom they hit the bedroom door and they turn around and they come back out and what do we say no way you get back in your room I didn't say you could come out now you go back to your bedroom and you stay there until I tell you you can come out so they go back down they stay there a little bit longer then they come back out and you just keep getting more and more agitated as they keep sneaking out and so you say you get back in that room and you stay there until I tell you you can come out biting is not good and you hurt your sister now you stay in that room now they go down there and because they don't really quite understand what's happening they come back out in a few minutes and they're crying now what do we say okay now you're sorry you know I see your tears and now you're sorry okay now you can come back out and don't you do that again tears in a little child don't necessarily mean remorse they don't mean repentance it means that they're very very frustrated and so we feel as we give them a consequence or if we give them some kind of punishment that it has to be intense enough to make them feel really bad so that they'll repent and not do it again. And yet, that very idea that we have to make them feel worse, assuming that then they will act better, is not correct. What the bottom line to that philosophy is, is if we do it bad enough, they'll be afraid. And fear will make them not do it again. We don't want to govern by fear. We want them to internalize a principle so they'll be self-motivated to act in a better way. And that will never come based on fear. So we have to, in our discipline that we'll talk about next week, we have to create courage in the child so that they choose to want to do better. And so if you kind of think about it as they're discouraged and need to receive courage so that then they can act better. Remember when you're disciplining that you cannot build a positive on a negative foundation. You cannot build something positive on a negative foundation. And so with that being said, a lot of times when we tell our children what to do, when we correct them, we tell them what not to do. Stop biting, don't slam the door, don't hit, don't take that truck away from your brother. We tell them what we don't want them to do and assume that what they're internalizing is what they should do. So we think that what they hear, now remember this is a three-year-old, so if we say, stop biting, that's not nice, that they're hearing, oh, that hurt my sister, I should never bite. That's unkind. That's not what Jesus would do. And when they don't act like that's the way they internalize it, then we get angry. But we haven't taught them how to behave. 
We've only told them what not to do. So in discipline, our focus has to be on teaching them what we want them to do to create a positive foundation upon which they can build. Does that make sense? And if there is something that's really, really hard to do, that's it. To learn how to rephrase your discipline for them. To rephrase it in a positive way. And so as you try to see about that this week, as you think about this week, when they do something that you're, you don't want them to do, and you're inclined to say, stop, da 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 da, -da Think, take a moment, just take a moment and say, what do I want them to do? So stop hitting your brother. What do I want them to do? I want them to play nice. So say that instead. Say, I really love it when you two can play nice together. Couch it in what you want rather than what you don't want and it comes across to them in a more positive way that they're, they can internalize better than the don't. So think about how you say things. It's, it's really important that they learn that you will keep your word. So if you say something in a consequence, then you need to do it. So you found a child that was sneaking in the cookie jar this afternoon and you say, you know, I feel really bad about that because now you won't be able to have any dessert for dinner. Okay, you keep your word. It may be that you hadn't even planned on having dessert for dinner, but now you better have dessert for dinner. And in love, as you serve all of the other children, in love you can say, I am so sorry that you had yours earlier. You don't rehash a lecture. You're on their side, you're their, cheer, their cheerleader, but you're firm and kind, you don't give in. As they learn that you mean what you say, you will find that they'll push against you less. What happens is we get tired or we get frustrated or they're begging, 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 and we're tired of hearing that. And so we capitulate and give in. And as we do that, they learn that if they push hard enough, they can get their way. So they learn to push with greater intensity. And that leads to power struggles. So if they learn that you keep your word, then they push less. Because they know if you say something's going to happen, it will happen. So be careful. Watch what you say. If you say, I'm going to go get in the car and I am leaving in two minutes. And then you get in the car and the two minutes pass by and you think, but I don't want to leave my, I can't leave my three-year-old there all alone. Don't say that if you're not going to do that. Does that make sense? So be careful what you say, but when you say it, be sure that you do it. Discipline can never occur in the way you want it to, in uh, correcting misbehavior in a positive way, if you are angry at them, if you are really mad at them, then you can't discipline them in, in a way that will be uplifting to them. Or if you're really afraid. If you're angry, you will go right into power struggles and you will say, it will too be my way and it will be my way because I am the mom. <laughs> and you push, 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 and, and then there's conflict. And if you are afraid of them not liking you or afraid of what will happen, then you tend to give in and you become more permissive and that doesn't teach them self-discipline either. So in anger and in um, fear, you, it's almost impossible to be able to discipline in a positive way. Another thing is, before we ask a child to do something, see if you're willing to follow through. So if I want a child to go set the table, 
turn off the TV and go set the table. That's a very legitimate request at 4.35 in the afternoon, whatever. That's a, there's nothing wrong with that kind of request. And so that's what I want. But before I ask the child to turn off the screen and to go uh, set the table, then I need to ask myself a couple of questions. In the beginning, these will be intentional. You'll have to think about asking yourself. As you get on, you won't have to think about it. You'll just, you'll just know. It'll come naturally. But the questions you have to say is, number one, is the child capable? So if you're asking a, a six-year-old, a seven-year-old to set the table, you, I'm sure, have taught him how that is done, how to do it properly already so that they're capable of doing it. If you ask a three or four year old to set the table, you may or may not have had them learn that to the point where they can do it themselves. They may still need help in doing it. So the first question you ask yourself is, is the child capable of doing it? And that means, number one, is, has he been taught? Does he know how to do it? And number two, sometimes, when our children are really, really tired, or really hungry, or just having a horrible day, we ask them to do things that emotionally at that moment they may not be capable of doing. I love the one where we say that they're just having a horrible day, and it's terrible, they're, they're tired, they're hungry, they've had a rotten day, and we say to them, Okay, I need you to go clean up your attitude and go set the table. Well, they may be capable of setting the table, but maybe not cleaning up their attitude in that particular moment. They may need a little bit more love and encouragement and help in doing that. So it, it, there's a lot of things to consider. But the most important is, the most important, when you ask them to do anything, the question is, are you willing to follow through? So if they don't do it, are you willing to get up and help them. And I don't mean grab them and haul them off, but help them, and we'll talk about encouraging ways to do that next week. But if you're not willing to see it through, don't start, initiate the nagging. Will you turn off the TV and let's set the table? And they don't do it. Turn off the TV and let's set the table. And they don't do it. Turn off the TV and let's set the table. If you're just going to nag, then don't ask it. So you have to be willing to follow through if it doesn't happen. Yes? Okay, so last night we had a power struggle. I have a two-year-old who is definitely in the I can do it myself mode. Mm -hmm. And it was time to get pajamas on, and I tried to help her get pajamas on, and she absolutely refused. A lot of times I can say, okay, do you want me to help you, or do you want to do it yourself? Mm -hmm. And she will go ahead and do it. But this time, it was absolutely, you know, I could have forced her into pajamas, but I just let her go to bed in her clothes because I didn't think it was worth the fight. I don't know if that was right or not, but that's, that's the way we handle it. That can be a right. I mean, I don't know what the situation was because I wasn't there either. But to say, is that wrong? Not necessarily. Uh, the continuous fighting is wrong. So, you know, I can't tell you that right or wrong because I wasn't there. But I can tell you that in some circumstances, that's not wrong. It's better than fighting. But it depends on how the whole scene was enacted. And we don't have that picture right now. So usually if you do it right, you will be at peace. If you do it wrong, you're going to still have feelings of frustration in your heart. So you think about it. Think about the goal and think about how you handled it. The spirit is the great teacher what's, who knows your children and you. And so it's the spirit that will teach you. So next week when we talk about the 14 tools, we'll see if there's some, a different tool that you could use that may have induced cooperation. But right now I couldn't tell you 
if that's right or wrong. Okay? I think in your uh, syllabus, you have what I have entitled the action line. And it looks like this. It's a right angle with a line going up from the corner. It's not that much. It's, but this is what the action line looks like. And if you just draw one on your paper, just draw the right angle with this kind of uh, scoopy line going up the middle, we'll talk about it. One leg of that right angle, you need to label emotion, and it doesn't matter which one. And one leg of that right angle, you need to label as time. And then as you draw that scoopy line that goes up, this one right here, like this. You can labor that anger. And so, in the corner where the right angle intersects, put a zero there. Now let me explain this because this is one of the key elements of good discipline. In the beginning when we want a child to do something, and we ask them, we are at level zero. The child is at level zero. Neither one of us are angry. So we'll go back to the children are upstairs, they're playing games, they're being good, they're wonderful. It's time now for them to come down and help with dinner. And so it's very appropriate to give them breakaway time and breakaway time is rather than saying, okay kids, I need you to come down right now. Most of us need a little bit of time to disengage from uh, whatever we're doing. I don't want my husband to come in and say, okay, I need your attention right now. I wanna have a minute to disengage and then I'm more than happy to give him the attention. Or when you were on your phone and she came in and wanted to talk to you right now, that can be irritating and it's disrespectful. So to say, okay guys, you got 10 minutes and then I need you all downstairs to help with dinner. Or, you know, finish that game you're playing and then come down. Or at the next commercial, come down. Depends on what they're doing up there. So at the end of 10 minutes, now remember, right now, both of you are at level zero. Nobody's unhappy. They're not unhappy because they haven't had to disengage, but they've been warned what their time period is, you're not unhappy because you don't expect them for another 10 minutes. So then at the end of the 10 minutes, then you say, okay, I need you to come down now, turn off all the stuff and come on down, I need your help. And chances are, you'll go right on fixing your dinner and getting ready and nobody will appear. And so then, in another 10 minutes, you'll say, Kids, come on, I told you, turn that stuff off and come down, I need your help. Now, as you watch this line, okay, your emotion is going up as time gets longer. Now you're into it 15 to 20 minutes and your, your temperature is rising because they haven't come yet. So your emotion is going up as time goes on and they do not do what you want them to do. So they still don't come. And so then in another 10 minutes, I mean, you're almost ready to eat. And dad's gonna be walking through the door. And so now you say, you kids get down here. I am tired of calling you, this is the third time. Now get down here, I need your help. Then later on that evening, you, you're talking to your mom on the phone, and you say, mom, I don't know what's the matter with these kids. They don't do anything I ask them until I yell. And I don't want to yell at them all the time. And I don't know what's wrong with them. Why they just won't obey. Go back to Elder Packer. Maybe we need to change us before we change them. So your children are, have been conditioned that when your voice reaches a certain level, you are going to act. So that when they hear you saying it really loudly, they also can almost hear your footsteps on the stairs. They know you're coming. So they are actually uh, obeying according to what I call the action line. When they know that you're gonna act, they're gonna move. 
And so it's just like keeping your word. We have got to move our action line closer to our level zero. So what that means is right here, here's the action line now, I'm gonna move that clear back here. So this is what it would look like. I will say, okay kids, 10 minutes, and then I need you to turn everything off and come down and help me. At the end of the 10 minutes, rather than hollering at them again, I would go upstairs, and if it's a, a TV, I would turn off the TV and stand right in front of the TV and say, okay kids, I need your help now, let's go downstairs. Now they're going to, that you're going to get a little pushback. Why do we need to do that? You smile. See, now you're still at level zero, so you can react in a positive way. You can say, oh, I know you were just watching that. It was so much fun, but I really do need your help now. And they'll, they'll follow you down. Now, it doesn't mean that if you move the action line down, that they will always be, yippee, skippy, we get to go help now. Woohoo! It's not going to do that, but they come to know that when you say 10 minutes, you mean 10 minutes because you've moved the action line down. So when we put the action line out further, that's when we get into lots of lecturing and repetitive, repetitive, telling them over and over and over and over and over what we want them to do when we should have acted way sooner and then we don't have to do the lecture series. Lecture series comes the further we move down that action line. So it is, it is one of the really good tools to get that action line moved down a lot closer to your level zero. Anytime you change how you uh, discipline your children, it will get worse before it gets better. And that's just the way it goes. Because, for example, you move down your action line, they're gonna push, push, push. They're, they're comfortable, they're familiar with you yelling at them. So even though they don't like it, it's what they're familiar with. And they'll always push to be where it's familiar, because then they feel like they at least know what's going on. And when you change that, it throws them off a little bit and they're unsure about what this new picture looks like and so they will try to get it to be what it was before so anytime you change anything it's always good to start with a family home evening on it so they can see the new picture and they know what the new expectation is let's say um, you let your children play outside every day after school from the moment they get home till dinner. And you now want to change that and have both work time and family time at home. And so you want to change the way that picture looks. So if you have a family home evening that says, okay, I feel it's really important that we have more family time together and we need to learn to do work better together. So uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and Thursday, we're going to be having family time and work, and Friday is gonna be your friend time, and you get to have friend time. So you always help them see what they can do, when they can do it. You may say, Monday, Wednesday, our work time, and Tuesday, and Thursday, Friday. I'm not telling you what to do, I'm just saying that as you change their picture, present it to them up front. Let them get that picture up front of what it will be. Does that mean they won't push? No, it does not. They probably will push. But then if you will stand firm and kind, they will come to realize that that's the new norm. That's the new picture that it's going to be. And they will learn to accept it and want to be part of it. Yeah. Okay, so I um, have a question. My daughter is eight and she kind of struggles with reading and I'm just trying to apply what you're talking about. Um, like it's like a huge thing for us, for her to have to practice. Uh -huh. And so we start out, you know, I give her time. Oh, okay, we, we practice in 10 minutes and, you know, we have this paragraph they have to read or mm -hmm. whatever. 
telling you now are parameters of discipline. What you would do is apply one of the 14 tools. Then you need to discipline, okay? This is just setting up groundwork of what discipline, what needs to happen before you have the right to discipline. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you can, and just this be really fast cliff notes, but you could say if you wanted to apply consequence, you would say every minute that you whine up front will be one more minute of reading. So if you need to read for 10 minutes, you now are going to read for 11 or 12 or whatever. You know, there needs to be a consequence. Mm -hmm. You don't just accept that behavior and you're not necessarily doing anything wrong. You also can say, if she's eight years old, you can use the clock rather than saying you have 10 minutes. You can say every, you get home from school at three o'clock, then every day at 3.20, so you've had a chance to eat, have a little snack and put your stuff away, at 3.20 I will meet you on the couch and we will read your paragraph. And for every minute you're late on the couch, you can have a consequence. Mm -hmm. Does that sound? Yeah. But then you're not nagging all the time. You're holding her accountable to something that's a, a nondescript entity, you know, the clock. So she's responsible to the clock. And I promise you, the first few times, she will earn extra time. Because they always push back. But if you're very consistent and very loving about that, then she'll get to know that you really do mean that at 20 after, you'll be on the couch. And she needs to be there, too. Do you see? Yeah. So, but that's next week when I teach you the tools. That's kind of so you need a tool. <laughs> that's okay. Those are your little sneak preview. That's your trailer for next week. <laughs> but we're going to learn 14 of those. Okay. Remember that when you're trying to implement these 14 tools that we'll talk about next week, the key is to change percentages. So you're not going to get them right all the time. You're still going to have times when you're going to be nagging and lecturing. But if you can begin the process of changing percentages, you will find that their behavior will change. It'll throw them off a tad, because they kind of want you to be what you've always been because they're comfortable with that, even if it's not positive. But they're comfortable, they know what it is. So as you change, you can expect a little bit of um, problems with it. Okay, so what I want to do for just a minute is talk to you about the difference between punishment and discipline because we have to get um, you have to see what the difference is so that you can know where you're at because they're not the same and what I want to help you do is to discipline and what we tend to do is punish and even our mentality is punish. And so we want to say, if you do something bad, then this is going to happen. It's kind of almost a revenge kind of thing. You're going to get it. If you, if you do something bad, then you're going to, you get this consequence, and you're going to have to do this, or I'm going to give you 27 extra jobs, or you, you, you know, and say, oh, no, we don't. Well, watch yourself this week and see how you do it. And when we're into punishment, it is kind of the parental mentality is you will pay for your misbehavior. And even though you say, oh, I'm not that way, just look at it when you're in the moment and see. Because discipline, that punishment is into power, parental power. I will make you do what you need to do. And the frustration comes when I've done everything I can and I haven't made you do it, then I am really at a loss and then I need to know, Sister Channer, tell me, tell me, tell me what to do because they're not doing it. They're not doing it right. What can I do to make them do what I want them to do? Well, bottom line is you can't. You can't take away their agency. The Lord gave them that in the pre-existence and that's theirs and you can't take it away. So in punishment, uh, if you look at your syllabus, it's focused on the child behavior. It's focused on the child's behavior. 
and this is not written right because it's focused on not the child but it's focused on behavior and I am focused on making the behavior correct and I'm not focused on the child I'm not separating child and behavior the child is the bad behavior does that make sense so you're bad because you hit stole told a lie that makes you bad and so in punishment then I am going to make you do something I'm gonna make you feel bad so that you can be good that's punishment uh, it is the goal of punishment is immediate change we want immediate change and so we'll ground them we'll send them to their room we'll uh, put them on a chair all of these things wanting immediate change and we get frustrated when we've punished them and they don't come out with immediate change oh I'm so sorry I did that oh I'm so sorry let me take the garbage right out oh I'm so sorry if if we, we don't get this uh, feeling back of immediate remorse and repentance then we frequently feel like it hasn't been a strong enough punishment and therefore our intensity to punish may increase so uh, we also with punishment when we're into that mode we are uh, frequently as parents will use guilt as a tool to get them we guilt them into doing what we want them to do and that works for a while and then it doesn't work for a long time but whenever we use guilt as a form of seeking to help them change their behavior then they will carry baggage later on they will carry baggage what do you mean by guilt like i don't i don't know if i guilt them or not so like, okay let me let me give you an example um let's say let's say I don't want my children to eat sugar okay then guilt would be now you have your choice you can choose to eat that donut if you would like to because you have your agency but all of that sugar in your body will just play havoc and your pancreas will be really thrown out of whack and you can't get the insulin to do it and it's addictive you know sugar is really addictive to your body and you shouldn't have a lot of that and so you just make it make them feel really guilty about their choice and they say but you can do whatever you want <laughs> that's guilt so you just have to be careful are all of those things truth absolutely but it's good to teach the truth in a different moment and not in that moment a lot of people use uh, would Jesus do that <laughs> would Jesus hit his sister that's guilt that's guilt so you're making them feel guilty about the choice that they would make rather than teaching them a correct principle and making them act on principle and if you do that Parents can become really good at that, and if children buy that, they carry that for all, through adulthood until they learn to recognize and get. I mean, they can get rid of it. No, it's not forever, but it becomes something that they have to work on to get rid of as they go on. Okay. Sometimes that's another one that I want you to look at during the week because it's it's one that sometimes parents use without even realizing they're making their kids feel guilty that they feel guilty great you mean to tell me you got to see you're smarter than that I know you can do better than that how come you you know how come you didn't get an A I know you're good in math does it feel the guilt so that transfers to you think I should have been better and I didn't do it and so I'm bad and that's the guilt that we tend to use. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. So, kind of help me understand. So, like, let's say that I have a, a child that's hit another child. Um, is part of how you respond to that having them apologize? Like, where's that line where, like, maybe they don't feel bad? <laughs> they, they probably, 
probably don't. So like, how do you teach, I don't know, how do you teach that to your child? Like, I'm so guilty. glad you asked that question because next week I'm going to teach you <laughs> the four <laughs> steps of a correct apology, okay. which makes them responsible for their behavior. Okay. It may not make them feel remorseful for their behavior, but it will create responsibility for their behavior. It is a fabulous tool, and it's one of the tools of discipline. See how much fun next week's gonna be? I told you you'd be frustrated today. I feel really good about it. Okay, now let's look at, at discipline, because what I want us to focus on is not punishment, but discipline. And it's very hard for some parents to discipline because they feel like they're giving up power. And power goes with punishment. And so it isn't a contest of power. Discipline is the process of teaching them correct behavior. So discipline does not necessarily get immediate results. Sometimes it takes a period of time for a child to change negative behavior. But discipline is the process of teaching them and giving them the courage to take responsibility to, have, to perform the behavior in a positive way. So it is a teaching process more than an immediate correct change the behavior process. What we want them to do is to learn to be self-motivated in choosing what's right. Not have an outside external force requiring them to be good. We want that goodness to come from their inside out and that comes as you teach them correct principles and help them in love correct misbehavior in a way that's resilient so that they can feel like uh, when they do something wrong, they can change the behavior and do it right, but it has no uh, reflection on their personal value. So discipline separates child and behavior. And in discipline, we're going to teach to the behavior and validate the child. We will always be validating and teaching the child of their worth, even when they make mistakes, even when it's, they do something wrong, that they, as, a, as an individual, as a child of God, have worth, and they've made an incorrect choice. And the choices can be changed, and they can be corrected, but it doesn't demean the value of the child. That's the key. That's the key difference between punishment and discipline is separating the two and using discipline as teaching instead of kind of getting even. So um, discipline will, over time, see, punishment's immediate, discipline is over time, and over time then, discipline will inspire correct behavior. But it is not an instant change. Now, as we go in to um, seeking to learn the proper way of discipline, its, it's uh, foundation, what makes it effective is if you have a, um, a full bank account, emotional bank account. And so the key is when the child is behaving correctly, is to always be seeking to feel, fill up that emotional bank account. I think we've talked about this before, but emotional bank accounts are 10 to 1, meaning you have to deposit 10 validations before you can withdraw one correction of a negative behavior. Because those things are just that much heavier emotionally a negative is that much heavier emotionally than the positive is. So you have to constantly be uh, validating. So when the moment comes that you need to correct, there's enough in that positive bank account 
that it won't make your relationship in the negative because it needs to be in the positive. Now, you, you remember that we talked about, uh, oh, I forgot the word, how they, uh, how, how they cleave, how we cleave to them, uh, how we, no, I can't remember. Attachment. attachment, attachment, thank you. I know it's an A word, yes. <laughs> so that attachment, that's what you want to be intact before you discipline. And that comes as you keep that emotional bank account high. And we've talked about all the things, you know, that create that good attachment. All of these things, these five first lessons, create the good attachment. That has to be strong. And then you can, you can discipline in positive ways, and it will, it will not uh, affect your relationship with them. If the attachment isn't there, if the bank account isn't full, then when you go to discipline, they become very, uh, very unhappy. And, and they don't listen to what you have to say. They're too busy being mad at you for saying it. Does that make sense? And so they don't take it on as themselves. They take it on as you're the bad guy and you're just yelling at me. So we talked about, for just a minute, we talked about the fact that it's discouraged children who misbehave. Now, what are the, do you remember the areas that we said when we were talking about self-esteem uh, that every person needs? They need to feel loved. They need to feel like they're an individual. They need to feel like they belong. And they need to feel like they're of worth. So how we discipline affects those four things. Critically affects. So sometimes you're going to have a child that's constantly in trouble. And you're always on them. And it doesn't take very long before they just feel like they're of no worth. And you hate them. And it's because of the way they perceive our discipline for them. So there is a, and you'll find this, there's a chart in your syllabus on the levels of discouragement. And what this is, is for our children, if they're a little bit discouraged, and then that discouragement builds and it builds and it builds, depending on how we have disciplined them. If we use punishment, these will build. If we use good discipline, then, then they feel of worth and their discouragement doesn't continue to rise. So these are the levels of discouragement. These apply to little people up to, oh, about nine or 10. And the reason I say that is at age nine or 10, and it seems to get less every, you know, seems to be continually getting less, is at that point, they may be really attached to peers rather than home, than friend, parents. So if they become really attached to peers, then their misbehavior can be uh, caused by their desire to be part of a group, the influence of the peers. Uh, sometimes for teenagers, it's wanting an adrenaline rush, wanting to have uh, you know, exciting times. Uh, a lot of it is wanting to have their own identity and be their own person when you're talking about teenagers. So the reasons for these teen misbehavior can be different than for our younger people. But these levels that we're going to talk about right now are uh, mostly for your, your little people up to about, I would say, depending on how mature they are, fifth, sixth grade. And then you go into your teen reasons for misbehavior, which can includes a lot more, includes a lot more variables than this. But for your little people, the first level of discouragement is what's called undue attention. And you have to realize that even though the child is acting out of uh, what, what we're going to call as discouragement, he's acting out from an unmet goal. 
And it can be based on truth or not truth. So it doesn't really matter because his truth is truth to him. So it doesn't matter if you say, that's not true. I do too love you. I do too. You are too important to me. If they don't feel it, it doesn't count. It only counts if they can internalize it. Then it counts. So these, uh, these levels of discouragement may not necessarily be based, well, probably are not based on your truth. But they are based on their truth. And it is an unconscious truth. It's not a premeditated truth. So for example, let's do the first level of, of discouragement is called undue attention. And undue attention is they feel like, remember one of the needs is to feel belonging. And so they feel like the only way they belong is if you are interacting with them. Now this can go up to, this starts with little tiny 18 month olds, these starts with little babies and goes up to, it can go up, it can go all the way, I mean it can never end. But what happens is I only feel a value if you interact with me. So if you're paying attention to someone else, then I don't feel a value and I need to get that attention back to me because I only feel valuable if you're interacting. This starts with little things like a, a baby in a high chair. They have an 18 month to a two year old in a high chair. They are not consciously thinking about, are you paying attention to me? But when they're involved in undue attention, let's say you've put some toys on their tray and they start chucking them off and you sweetly go over and pick them up and put them back. And they go and laugh and smile at you. But the minute you turn your back to do something, they check them all off so that you will come back and put them back on the, the, the high chair for them. They're not really playing with them, but they're using them to keep you involved with them. Now, at this age, it can be either annoying or it can be really cute, depending on, sometimes, depending on the child. Um, your tendency, and if you look at the chart, the, the way you tell what level these, these children are on is really not by their behavior, but it's by how you feel about their behavior. Because they can do the same behavior and be at different levels, but how you feel usually translates more correctly what level they're on. So when they're on undue behavior, in the beginning, the first, you know, five times you pick up the toys, it's just fine. You just, you just pick them up. And then you get a little bit annoyed because you can't get dinner. And you can't do what you're doing. And, you know, they want you always there interacting with them. So you have this tendency to coax. You know, don't, don't throw your toys down. You know, leave your toys on the high chair. Let's not throw them off. And, and we feel annoyed. We just, we're not mad, but it's just a little bit irritating. Now what happens is in this, on this level, if you're interacting, if you're paying attention, the misbehavior temporarily stops. So while you're right there talking to him, saying don't throw away your, you know, don't throw those on the floor, they're not throwing them on the floor. And they're looking at you and talking to you and it's just so sweet and wonderful. But the minute you turn your back, and you're not engaged is when it it starts again. And if you don't re-engage, it can become more intense. So now they've chucked it all over and now they're kind of beating on the on the high chair or they're starting to cry. So it's that feeling that if I'm not involved with you all the time, then I'm not of value. This goes up to children as they get into school age, or even little people after they're talking. They want to be talking to you all the time. And they follow you around. And they are cute, and they're wonderful, and they're saying darling things. But every once in a while, it's like, a little bit like a mosquito. You know, you just like to, could you just go somewhere else for a minute? You know, it's, it is that need for constant attention that makes them feel valuable. So at this point, 
is where I said to her, it's okay to teach them, wait just a minute, and let me finish what I'm doing, and then I will talk to you, or then I'll look at your paper, or then I will be engaged. Because when you engage on their demand, you reinforce this negative feeling that they have that I'm only important if I have your attention. When we give attention on demand like that over and over and over and over, it just reinforces that. So the, um, the tools that you correct it with is ignore the incorrect behavior when you can. Uh, so if they're banging on the on a table or the high chair, you know, ignore it. Uh, the key is to not give attention on demand, but to give lots and lots of positive attention when it's not on demand. So let's go back to the baby in the high chair that's that's beating on the high chair or throwing all the toys off. Then, you know, say it's a two-year-old, which you can marginally begin to communicate with. They're, they be, they're the beginning of reason. You can talk with them. And, and so you can say, I can see that you really don't want to be in your high chair. Let me get you down to play until dinner's ready. So you don't necessarily force them to sit up there with no toys. They can get down and they can go play, but you're not going to be entertaining them the whole time. You pull back, don't give them attention on demand, but give them lots of attention when they're doing positives and validating them and filling their emotional bank account so that they know their value, but they don't get to demand attention. Because then you're validating their erroneous thought process of they're only valuable if you're paying attention to them. So then the next level of uh, discouragement is one that some of you work with, and that is your power struggle. And a power struggle really is a discouraged child. It is a child who, uh, when we talked about the color code, it's typically your red children who tend to be very much in need of power. But you put a red child with a red parent and you can have some real doozy experiences because they're both feeling like in order to be of value, I have to be right. I have to be in control. I have to have the power. And so uh, I had a red, a very red child and her feeling was, if I do what you say, then I lose my identity and I become you. And do you see how frightening that is for a child? That's scary. That's scary for them to feel like they're losing who they are. And so the more we agree to be locked in the power struggle with them, these are the ones who you'll tell them a reason why they can't go to a friend's house and it's, but why? I've got this amount of time and I don't have to do anything. I don't have any homework. How come I can't go? And you say, well, we're going to be having dinner here in a little while. But why? And they'll just push and push and push and push and push against you until, because they feel like if they don't win, they're losing their identity. And that's frightening for them. You feel like if you don't win, you're losing your power as a parent. And so we both agree to engage in the battle. And as it, as it goes on, the feelings of anger increase and the value, the personal value of that child decreases. Because as they feel angry and they feel like you're always angry at them, then they feel like you don't love them. Which is not the truth, but that's the way they feel like. So when you have a child that is in uh, power, your tendency, when they're always doing this, but how come, but why, but yeah. You know, my sweet dar darling daughter would argue about the color of the sky. There was just not much, it's not even me telling her what to do, it was just in having conversation, she would argue. Things that didn't even matter, she would argue. That's, that's where reds come from, that, this power struggle. Now, bottom line is, if you engage in those, thinking you'll win, you will, 
from, you know, as they're little, you will, but as they get older, you won't. And they just get better and better and better at power struggling. And you get more and more and more defeated as, as time goes by. Let me share with you an experience with this daughter of mine. She, um, she wanted a new pair of shoes and needed a new pair of Sunday shoes. Not just she wanted them, she really needed a new pair of Sunday shoes. And it was about this time of year, Easter was coming up. And I uh, told her, and she was about, I wanna say around fifth grade, it's about fifth grade. And I said, okay, you know, let's go. Let's go to the store and let's get you some new shoes. And we drove to Payless Shoes and we got out and we went in and um, I said, sweetheart, this sandal is appropriate, this kind of a shoe is appropriate, this kind of shoe is appropriate, this kind of shoe is appropriate for you being in fifth grade. And I said, see if you can find something that you really like. Um, and she went and found a pair of lovely spiky heels that she wanted to wear. And I said, sweetheart, those are not appropriate when you're in fifth grade. You know, when you're 16 or so, and you wanna wear those, that's fine. And you know, we can get them for you. But in fifth grade, those aren't appropriate. This is appropriate, this is appropriate, this is appropriate, this is appropriate. But why, but why, I just wanna wear them. I just think they're so cute, I just, these are all ugly, why can't I have them? Okay, so you're beginning, you see the conflict? So I said, you know what? You just decide what you'd like. I'm gonna go sit out in the car. Well, this was in the days where you, it wasn't quite like it is now. Anyway, my car was parked right in front of the store and I could see exactly where she was. And she walked around the store for 45 minutes. And I sat in the car. I won't sit, tell you that I sat out there peacefully and calmly. I was not. I, I was working on my emotions to keep them under control. And so because a parent in these power struggles, you get angry. And your feeling is you will too do what I say. You will too. I am the parent. You will too do what I say. And so we tend to get angry. So you have anger and anger uh, hitting against each other. And you will not. What you need to remember about a, pow a power struggle is in the moment you will never resolve. Ever. Ever. Even if you're at peace and they're not, in the moment, because they are not in a mindset to negotiate or seek to understand. So in that moment, you will never, ever, ever resolve. You can force, you might have power to force sometimes, but you will never win. You will never win in that moment. So anyway, after about 45 minutes, Carrie came out to the car and she said, Mom, why can't I have those shoes? I just don't know why you, everybody at school has those. How does she know what they wear in church? Anyway, you know, she started, just started right up where she had left off. And I said, well, you know, honey, get in the car and, and let's just talk about it for a minute. And so she got in the car, her first mistake, and I locked the doors and started the car. I was driving, driving away. And um, she just went on and on and on and on, all the way home. And I said, oh, I just feel so really, really bad that you didn't find something that you liked, but I do have another meeting that I have to get to and I don't have time to stay at the store any longer. And so I, I feel really bad that you didn't find anything you liked. But mother, why would you just let me have your hair? Then you withdraw. You totally withdraw. And they can go on and on and on and on and on if they'd like to, but you withdraw because they're not listening to anything you say. So we got home and she came in and we did what we had to do. And anyway, she didn't have any new shoes. And so uh, she got really unhappy about it the next weekend because it was Easter and she only had tennis shoes to wear to church. And she, she said, mom, I gotta go to the store. You know, we gotta go to the store. We gotta go to the store and get me some shoes. And I just have to have my shoes and you have to take me to the store to get me some shoes. And, and I said, I'm so sorry, Carrie. I'm so, so, so sorry. I just, I don't have time today. I don't have time today. I would be happy to take you next weekend and we'll get you some. So she ended up wearing her tennis shoes on Easter Sunday. And she was really not happy about that. 
in the next week, I took it back to the store and I said, these are appropriate, these are appropriate, these are appropriate, these are appropriate. See if you can find some here that you know that you like. I know they won't be your favorite, but see if you can find some that you would like. And she found some that would do. And, and then she wasn't happy about it, and she was just, I still don't see why I can't have those. But the wind had gone out of the fight. So when you have a power struggle child, in the moment of the fight, there's two things to do. Two things to do. Number one is disengage. You stop lecture ser series, you stop saying why, you stop trying to convince them that their right is wrong. So you stop fighting, because they're not listening to anything you're saying. And the second thing you do is use to me what is a magical word, and it is nevertheless. <laughs> I think it is absolutely a magical word in power struggles. So you let them vent and vent and vent and vent and vent and vent and vent. And then you say, I am so sorry that you are so frustrated. Nevertheless, you need to get the sandals or the da 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 da. Nevertheless, you still need to be home at 10. Nevertheless, your bedroom still needs to be done before you can go to the ball game. I am so sorry you're frustrated. Nevertheless, and you only repeat it not more than twice, and then you just don't have to say anything. And then you just smile at them. Or you can walk away. You disengage. You disengage from the power struggle. They can be really hard. Now, if you have a child that has been using power struggles to get their own way, and if you have been giving in because it's easier to buy peace and let them have their own way, and you decide that you are going to do this, you can expect them to get a lot worse before they get better. Because in the past, if they kept on you, they would break you and you would give them their way. So their mentality, their, their brain is telling them, if I keep doing this longer, harder, you'll break and I can have my way. And the minute you do, you reinforce that that will be successful for them. So the first few th times will be horrible. I promise you they are horrible. Just remember, withdraw, and use nevertheless. Now I've had a lot of parents who have said to me, but isn't that just rude to withdraw? I mean, isn't that rude? No, it's rude to continue to fight with them. That's what's damaging. Now, however, as you disengage, you can use disengagement as power. If you're angry, if you use it when you're angry, then it can become a, a tool in power struggle. If you are a zero and you disengage and can lovingly look at that person and say, I'm just choosing not to fight, then you're, it works. It works. But you can, do you see how it can be used as a tool for power if you're using it the wrong way? It's like, I'll get even with you. I'll show you. I won't fight with you. Yeah, I win. If you have that attitude, it is, it is a, it's still a power struggle. So you have to disengage when you're at zero and do it for the intent of keeping peace. And now, I've had other people say, but if you disengage, then you give in. No, you don't, you're not giving in. You don't have to give in. Because I disengaged with my daughter didn't mean that she could have the spiky heels. It meant that at that moment I am not fighting anymore. I'm not fighting. So you don't give in. You're still kind and firm. Kindness says I won't fight anymore. Firmness says I will stick to what I said. What if it's 
not something you want them to do, like right then. You've asked them, and you you come back to it, and like dis disengaging does seem like a win. Like a no, no, and we'll talk about this when you use tools, because is it more important to you to have the dog walked at the moment or to win the cooperation of your child? Dog's never more important than the cooperation of a child. The child's always more important than the task. But there can be a consequence. So the task may not happen right now, but there can be a consequence for having it not happen right now. And the consequence also will be applied in love. And it will also be discussed, if you have a child that's prone to power struggles, in a peaceful moment, you will discuss what consequences will be. Does that make sense? So, child's always the most important, not, not, that's why I said discipline takes time. It doesn't happen in the moment, particularly with power struggling children. Okay, there's one more level of discouragement. And actually, I would take a power struggler over the last level. Because with a power struggler, the, the key is to redirect all this energy. But they at least have energy and they're moving. So if you can work to redirect the energy, most parents think that if you get a, a power struggling child, that's the worst kind. And yet, to me, it's the next level of discouragement that's harder for me as a parent to deal with. And that is when they are into revenge. And this frequently happens with, uh, more frequently I would say, with a white child where their spirit has just been broken and they quit. And so uh, their revenge is simply, they stop moving. I quit. I can't. I'm not good enough. You're right. I'm no good. I can't do that. And they become very difficult to get them to have faith in themselves again enough that they start moving. And they have to be moving before you can help direct that path. And so to get a, that child that's into revenge to move is hard. A child in revenge will also seek to hurt you because they're hurting. So they'll say, I hate you. How come I want to go live with the Joneses? They're nice. I hate you. I don't want to live here anymore. Uh, now we're talking about little people. Teenagers will want to go live with the neighbors for a different reason. <laughs> but little people, they will, they will seek revenge in trying to hurt you, in trying to say unkind things to you to hurt you. And they, they're doing it because they're hurting. And you have to be very careful not to respond uh, in pain, if you will, to those comments. Understand that they're hurting. This kind of child you really need to, um, to look at and, and love for who they are. And, and help them find courage in what they can do and who they are. Let me share with you a story in closing, but first of all, let me give you your homework. I want you to read uh, this conference talk. It's called Daughters of God by Elder Russell Ballard. And it is in the April of 2008, 11 years ago. Fabulous, fabulous, fabulous talk. And I want you to particularly notice his use of one-tenth. One-tenth. And it doesn't have anything to do with tithing. But I want you to notice his use of one-tenth. Then I want you to pay particular attention to how you discipline and see if you are a coach or a referee. 
Referees use punishment. They look at what you do wrong and throw the flag and tell you everything that's wrong. And a coach tells you what you're doing right and works on teaching you the correct principles of the game. So as you discipline your children, are you a coach or a referee? See if you can figure that out. So those are the two things I want you to do for your homework. So in closing, I want to sh I share with you a story. This was told in, in way before your time in a conference talk by Matthew Holland, which is President Holland's, I think it's his oldest son. And it was told in 1983. And the title of the talk was Muddy Feet and White Shirts. And it was given in a priesthood session, a conference where Matthew Holland spoke. Um, and I don't think at that time Elder Holland was um, one of the Twelve Apostles. I'm, I'm quite sure he was, and I think he was, may have been the president of BYU. Anyway, he, he tells us the story of when he was a young boy, he was a little boy, his parents lived in an apartment complex, uh, student housing, if you will, while his dad was going to law school. And one morning, it was a beautiful day outside, they had had rain over the night before, and there was a lot of mud outside, but um, it was nice, and Matthew wanted to go outside and play, and his mother said he could, she said, but don't get in the mud. And they had a little playground area for little people of these, this apartment complex. Remember, it's a different time, a different age, a different era. And so Matthew went outside to play. And his mother had been mopping and waxing their kitchen floor in their apartment. So he said he played out there for about an hour or so. And definitely being a little boy, he got into the mud. And I'm sure had some good muddy feet. And so at the end of the time, he, he finished playing, he was gonna go inside. And so he ran up the stairs to their apartment and burst into the door and ran halfway across the kitchen floor and realized his mother wasn't quite finished with the waxing and he was leaving a trail all the way across the floor. And so he says he ran on into his parents' bedroom and threw himself on the bed and just started to sob, just was sobbing. And wondering, in the, in the talk he says, he was wondering if he would meet his great grandfather sooner than he had anticipated. <laughs> but in a few minutes, his mom came in, Sister Holland came in, and he just blurted out, he says, I know you hate me. <laughs> and she grabbed him in her arms and took his little muddy feet and kissed them and says, no, I don't hate you. That's discipline. That doesn't mean he didn't get to come wipe up the muddy feet. It means that the primary feeling he had for making a mistake was his mother's love. And that's the goal of discipline that we help them understand that even in mistakes, they are loved. They are loved. They have Heavenly Father's love, and they have our love. And that depends so much on how we use discipline or if we're engaged in punishment. So look at yourself this week. Watch yourself this week. See what you're doing. See where you are. Check out your own emotions as your children misbehave. And then next week, I will give you 14 tools that you can use to correct misbehavior. It is not okay for them to misbehave. We have to parent. We have to teach them through positive discipline how to learn self-control, without which they can never become gods, and neither can we. Spirituality is all about gaining control over the natural man and seeking to develop Christ-like attributes. I bear you my testimony that this is God's plan.
in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.